I don't know how to do most things in life and neither do you. And unfortunately, a lot of people are not okay with that. They're not okay with not knowing the answer. And therefore, they want to have everything figured out before they even take a step. Take your next best step. And once you take that next best step, you will know more and clarity comes with action. Listen, if you got one subscriber, treat them like a rock star. If you got two readers for your books, treat them like rock stars. You don't deserve to have a bigger tribe, a bigger platform, until you begin treating the people that you have like rock stars. And I'll tell you what, that's the secret to growing. It's not to say, oh, we only got three people. We only got 10 people. We only got 20 people. We only got 500 people. Whatever the number, it doesn't matter. What matters is the people. You treat the people like rock stars, more and more people will want to come and be part of it. But if you despise the people that you have and think, ah, what's the use? Guess what? That comes off loud and strong. I believe success is what you do when nobody's watching. You know, anybody can have an Instagram life. Anybody can pretend to uh, take photos, you know, when everything is perfect. Nobody knows if you put in the work, right? I mean, you can sleep in, you can do whatever you want, except you can't. You, my friend, you know. You know what you do day in and day out. I know what I do day in and day out. And our battle isn't the haters, it isn't the critics, it isn't the cynics, it's ourselves. And so, I wanna challenge you, like, who are you doing it for? If you're doing it for the applause of others, you'll quit, you'll quit. Cause you know what? There's never an applause big enough to push you through the pain. I believe that we need to be comfortable with being uncomfortable. I believe that's what the secret of success is. It's doing the work when nobody's watching. It's doing the work day in and day out. And sure, everybody wants to stand on the stage in the light, but nobody wants to work alone in the dark, except for you. So I wanna say I believe in you. I'm excited for you. And I just want to uh, encourage you to keep going. Cause you know what? That deep work that you do when no one's watching is gonna create some unbelievable confidence. And that my friend is success. Kerry, thank you so much for being with us uh, in Inside the Writer's Bubble today. You are seven time uh, traditionally published author, uh, you're also a publisher and a speaker. Um, I would like to start with a book, it's uh, The Deeper Path. Yeah. This book is very interesting and really touched me. It's about pain. It's about the, the mm. pain that we all have. But yes. it's curious that what we do with it is we numb it, we ignore yes. it. And what, what, what happens when we numb it? Yeah. So I tell people in that book that when you numb your pain, you numb your potential. So what happens is that we, we begin masking our lives and pain is often a doorway and it's a doorway to a deeper realization of ourselves. Um, I believe that, you know, your listeners might have faith, they might not have faith, but for me, I believe that pain is a doorway to a deeper faith. And let's be honest, well, I, I don't like pain, most people don't like pain. Yeah. But the thing is, Sophie, that we have two pains in life. We have what's called chronic pain, where most people sit in that, you know? They sit in the chronic pain of, it's it's, it's underlying, it's dull, it's like always in the background. You know, like if you have too many programs in your computer up, it slows you down, you know? You should restart your computer, 
but you figure out ah, that would take too long. So instead you just sit there with the chronic pain, you know? So most people are doing that in their lives. The way we get over it is we actually invite acute pain. Acute pain is short term, it's intentional, it's focused, it's purposeful. And that's how we overcome our chronic pain. And you might say, well, how do you do that, Carrie? Maybe it's coaches who are truth tellers. Maybe it's counselors. Maybe it's like you reading, reading a book. Maybe it's writing a book because writing a book can be very therapeutic. But if people don't know my story, I was a cutter. I was a self-injurer. And even that, you might say, Carrie, that sounds really weird. Why would you inflict pain on yourself? And Sophie, the reason why is, you know, I did that in my teens and 20s. Now I'm in my 40s. But um, the reason why I did that for those years was because I could control the pain. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Self-injury is you deciding how often, when, because you feel so out of control that you mimic pain. But you know what? It's not that different than alcoholism, yeah. drug abuse. Of course. Right? Drug abuse, you know that you're causing yourself pain, but you, you mask and you hide and you never deal with the real issue. So in the book, The Deeper Path, we get to the real issue. Because I had a stuttering problem, you know, and I think honestly, Sophie, it all comes back to that perfection. You know, like I probably messed up as a kid speaking without even realizing that maybe somebody made fun of me and then boom, I got to speak perfect. And then when you try to speak perfect, you can't, you know? And so now, and then it's like, well, if I, if I mess up, people will laugh. People will make fun of me. And so then you like, you just stop speaking because, and that, and you know what? Let's use that metaphor for writers because that's what this topic is too. Mm -hmm. Writers feel that way. And this is writer's block. See, I couldn't speak with my mouth, but writers can't write sometimes. And I think the reason why is they think it has to come out perfect. It's always realization, right? I mean, some people look at what I'm doing today and they're saying, you speak, you coach, you write, you're a publisher, you got all these things. Just yesterday I was teaching and I shared that I invested a large sum of money in, my, in this last 12 months because I was kind of here and I knew I needed to get to the next level. And I remember starting to write that check and I got scared. And you might say, well, why are you scared, man? Because it, it was the largest check I'd ever written in my life for me. And that was the belief. The belief was, am I worth it? You see what I'm saying? Oh, yes. Am I worth it? Yes. And I hear this all the time. My clients say, should I hire you as an author coach? Should I, should I publish my book with you? And the same thing I tell them is what I had to tell myself. Your dream is worth it. You can do this. So all I'm saying is like, you never get to the point where you arrive and you never struggle. And you ne if you get there, you're dead, you know? So I'm always stepping it up, Sophie, always trying to go to the next level. One more word about the deeper path. Um, yeah. You mentioned the key word, and I think it's a word that is very important for you. It's clarity. Yes. Now you know what you want and you're dissatisfied with anything less. So most people say, oh, I want clarity. I, I really want clarity. And I look at them, you know, if I have a relationship with them and I say, I don't think you do want clarity. Because once you have clarity, now you have a choice. And now you need to take action. And so a lot of people like to be in confusion. They say they want clarity, but now they have accountability once they have clarity. What is the secret name about? You wrote yeah. it actually before the deeper path, didn't you? I think. Um, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. So your secret name was 2010. Deeper Path was like 2012 or 13. And then Day Job and Dream Job was 2014. And then most recently, we, we republished them all through, through my company, Author Academy Elite. 
because I knew that I wanted to do more things with, with them. But your secret name is about the lies and labels we believe about ourselves. So you probably, Sophie, had people say things to you, good or bad, growing up. Right? Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we all do, right? We all do. And sometimes people say, well, why is a positive thing negative? Well, if you're given the name beautiful as a young child and you think, well, that's who I am. I have to be beautiful. So I always have to look put together. I always have to say the right thing. I always have to look the part. That's so much pressure. But because, that's, you see what I'm sorry, saying? But it's, it's not what most people are told. They are told you are not enough. You are yeah, not, you are not enough. You are not enough. But I've even met, like I met a man one time who um, had the name Success. Like that wasn't his real name, but that was the name he was. And he was told from a young age, like, wow, you're so successful. Wow, you're so successful. And like he, that, that, that was a prison for him because he never attempted something that he could do as an adult where he might fail. Because what if he fails? Then he loses his identity. You see what I'm saying? So names, I call them, I, I say you have a birth name, which is given to you when you arrive in the world. You have given names, which are names that you inherit along the way. But then you have a secret name. And your secret name, I get this from an ancient book. It's called Revelation. And it's chapter 2, verse 17. But it says, it says, to the one who overcomes, so that's a key word, the one who overcomes, it talks about struggle. It talks about uh, victory. You got to have a, a struggle, which most people have on this call. But it says, to the one who overcomes will be given a new name written on a white stone. And no one knows the name except the one who receives it. So in the book, Sophie, I talk about how your whole life, God has been trying to tell you what your secret name is, but you've run from it. I've run from it. And you can't get your secret name by lying, by pretending. Where most people are, we're imposters. We pretend, we put on masks. So the way that you actually receive your secret name is to shed the mask and almost become like naked and now you're ready to receive that new identity. I'd like to move on to a very influential book, Day Job to Dream Job. Day Job to Dream Job, yes. Maybe your listeners have seen The Shawshank Redemption. Maybe they have. Is that pretty popular in Europe too? It's very popular. Very okay. Popular. So that, I had no idea. But see, because I'm not from Ohio. I'm from Wisconsin, which is a few states over. But I remember having to write my next book and I was signed for it with the traditional publisher back then, back when I used to do traditionally published. Now I do my own publishing company. But I, I got signed to do a book that I was not passionate about. So your writers will enjoy this. Like, like I changed, you know, and sometimes when you sign a contract, like you change two years later. So I had to write this book and I was like not feeling it. And so I was watching late night one time, The Shawshank Redemption. And during that time, I had just left my day job about a year before. And I'm watching that movie and I'm like, oh my gosh, that's totally how I felt in my day job. I felt like I was imprisoned. I felt like I had to break free. I felt like I was becoming institutionalized. And I said, you know what? I am going to write a book on how to go from your day job to your dream job, how to go from Shawshank to Zihuatanejo, which is in the end of the movie where Andy and Red reunite in Mexico. Mm -hmm. That's your dream job. And so then what I did, Sophie, is I Googled like Shawshank prison and I found out it was filmed at the Ohio State Reformatory. And I'm like, oh, I wonder where this place is. I wonder if it even exists still. And I start Googling and I realize, oh my gosh, it's 90 minutes from where I live. Because again, I didn't grow up, you know, I didn't grow up in Ohio. So I say, I'm, I'm going to go up there 
and try to get in Andy's cell and try to write part of the book. And my wife thought I was crazy. <laughs> She's like, how are you going to do that? I said, I don't know. And that's the point of the entrepreneur journey is like a lot of times you don't know how, you just know why and what. So I went to the gift shop. And Felicia was in the gift shop. I still remember her name. I, I, I want to say it's Felicia. It's a lot of years ago, but I think it was. And I just started talking to her and giving her attention, showing her value. And then here's another tip. I was authentic. I said, this is probably going to sound crazy. But I said, I'm an author from Columbus. I drove up 90 minutes. I said, in fact, here's one of my other books, Your Secret Name. I want to give it to you, uh, you know, just as a thank you. And I said, I have this crazy idea to write this book called Day Job to Dream Job in Shawshank Prison. Could I have permission to kind of like walk around and go in Andy's cell? And she's like, absolutely. Here's the Wi-Fi password that's, that's um, you know, secret, you know, you can have it and you can go write. And so like, I think people catch that. I think, I think a lot of times we think, what if someone's going to laugh at us? So there's some tips there. You know, tips are go to the people that not everybody goes to. Honor people. Listen to them. Don't try to get something. Give them something first. And then be authentic. You know, there's, there's just some tips there on my writer's journey. And then, so I went in Andy's cell, wrote some of the book there, and Shortly after, found out, oh my gosh, this is about five years ago, they're going to have a 20th reunion. They're going to have a 20th reunion anniversary, and Hollywood celebrities are going to come. So I was like, oh my gosh, when is it going to happen? And they said, August, like the following year. And I said, that's the same month my book's coming out. So I said, let's try to make something happen, you know. And I didn't say, hey, you should bring me in as a speaker, you know. What I did is I said, how can I serve you guys? I said, what do you guys need? And this is all business strategy. You know, I didn't say, how can you serve me? And they said, we need to have this guy come and sign books during the event. So there's the warden from the movie and me, who <clears throat> nobody even knows about, but we're together launching my book. I'd like to talk about the Elixir. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, it's a fiction book. Yeah, so it's a fiction book. That was scary, Sophie, to write a wow. fiction book, young adult. In the, in the book, the main character is an 18-year-old girl named Sienna. All those things were scary. People said, you know, why are you going to write a fiction book? What makes you think you can do this? How are you going to write from a woman perspective? Like, all the stuff that your listeners hear you know, about like the haters and your family members. And, you know, my family members are really awesome. But even their questions, you know, when you're fragile and you are like, should I do this? And they're kind of like, well, what do you know about fiction? Do you read fiction? You know, all that stuff we magnify and we kind of say, oh, the world's against me. But what I did is I said, you know what, I, I need to do this. And I wrote a fiction book about how a future society your brain gets hacked. Like they can hack phones, you know, they can hack computers, of course, but like your brain gets hacked. And in the book, there's this conspiracy that's happening. There's this hacktivist group, um, you know, called Swarm, and they're taking over the world. And Sienna and her friends are kind of like chosen. They get caught up in this. Uh, elixir project where they find out that they're the unhackable ones and they have to go through these verdicts and what I did Sophie is I actually had an end goal my end goal was you know what I see people's dreams getting hacked and so in the book as I'm writing this fictional story I'm actually also drawing out neuroscience and human performance and all these true tips and tactics and tools that became a course called Elixir Project Experience. 
and it teaches you in 30 days how to become unhackable in work and life. Because the average person touches their smartphone over 2,600 times a day with click swiped. You know, so we live in a world right now that has over 5,000 ads come across your face every day. People don't have enough time, focus, energy. So the book talks about that from fiction. And then the course is the nonfiction. And here's the first time I'll ever share it publicly. My next book is the nonfiction version of Elixir Project. So oh, wow. right now I'm currently actually writing a, a book for the masses on how to do that from a nonfiction strategy. Author Academy Elite, that's our writing, publishing, and marketing experience for authors. We actually publish their books we teach them how, so like I actually become their author coach, you know? So this isn't just, hey, send us your manuscript, we'll, we'll print it. This is a full on, you know, every week, small group coaching calls, and we take your book from idea to implementation. And the other cool thing is, I show you how to build a business around it. So a lot of authors are poor, because they think, oh, I'm going to write the book and then hit publish and the whole world's going to run to it. I show you how to turn your book into 18 streams of income, even fiction or children's or whatever. And this thing is taken off. Like we started it five years ago with nothing, with a phone call saying, hey, this might happen. And over the last five years, we've published over a thousand authors. This is what you say very often. Actually, the most difficult part is not writing. It's not writing the book. It's the marketing. Right. It's, it's the marketing that is very yep. difficult. And that's where um, writers struggle. They yes. write the book, they, they publish it, and then nothing happens. And you yes. are there to help them. To Everything. Launch parties, launch teams, digital press kits for media, how to get big name endorsements and forwards. Um, we, we talk about it all. We get, we get the books into brick and mortar bookstores, which a lot of books can't get into if they're um, not traditionally published. So we're kind of this not self-publishing, not traditional publishing. We never get a dime of your profits or print costs. There is a tuition, but beyond that, everything's included. It's, it's really unique. It's growing. Um, I, if anybody wants more information, they can go to authoracademyelite.com or uh, my name, carryoverburner.com slash book. Mm -hmm. And I teach them for two straight hours, free, everything about the publishing industry. And I say, if you like it, let's work together, apply. But there's no like, you know, credit card or anything like that. Like, you can just watch the master class as well. Mm -hmm. So most writers say, oh, I'll write a book. Okay, there's no deadline. And it's like the sun where you go out on a beach and it takes you three hours to get sunburned. Unless you have a magnifying glass, then it takes you three minutes. The same skin, same sun, the difference was the filter, the focus, the focus of the ray. And so most writers do not focus. A deadline is like that filter which causes the urgency to amplify. So I don't have my book anywhere close to done, but I have a conference in October called the Igniting Souls Conference. I know that I have to step it up and I will, because I gotta have a book for the conference. So, you know, that deadline's gonna help me finish it. Writing can be very lonely, and, because it's you, you know? And therefore, I think one of the reasons why Author Academy Elite is so successful is because we have a community. And every Monday is what's called Mission Monday. And there's phone calls where people can ask questions and say, I'm really struggling this week. So to write in community is very 
helpful. Now, with that being said, be careful of how you let people speak into your writing. I'm not saying writing communities so that everyone can critique you because certain people might not get it. And if you're a fragile writer, you might say, oh, they're right. So critique groups are okay, they're not bad, but make sure that the people are very select and that you wanna be like them because there's all kinds of armchair writers who say, oh, you know, here's how you should do it. Well, they haven't done it themselves. So that's one thing. And then the other tip I would say is, um, it's all about setting the, the, the mindset of writing. So for me, I usually have like a, a beverage, dark chocolate sometimes. I have a soundtrack that I'm listening to that's epic with no words, with no um, ads. Earbuds are amazing, you know? You can create your space with earbuds or AirPods or whatever. So all I'm saying is like, and then exercise. For me, part of this is like getting outside in nature, exercising, because when you're pushing it physically, then you can come back and push it mentally. But if you're eating chips and sitting on the sofa and watching all kinds of TV, why do you feel like, you know, you don't feel like just, oh, I'm gonna write something amazing. So I kind of think you gotta be pushing yourself in other areas of your life too. This is Carrie Oberbrunner, Be a Soul on Fire. This is Carrie Oberbrunner, Be a Soul on Fire. This is Carrie Oberbrunner, Be a Soul on Fire. Thank you, Carrie. Have a good day. You too. Take Thank care. You. We'll see you. Take ya. care.